So uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, the, sorry about that. The Free Market Roadshow uh, is um, basically a, a, a traveling conference that happens around um, the spring each year. And the plan this year was uh, to have two of them in the UK, one in Cambridge and one in London. Uh, both were scheduled to take place next week and we're going to be, uh, we, we were going to organize at the Ayn Rand Center UK. Unfortunately, as of right now, that's, that's not possible. Hopefully it might be possible even this year, but uh, the Austrian Economic Center, which organizes the Free Market Roadshow uh, around Europe, uh, is taking it online. And there have already been a few. You can find them on uh, the Austrian Economic Center YouTube channel. Uh, there will be more. And we are happy to host a panel that would have taken place live next week, uh, but is now taking place online, which means people from anywhere in the world can join. Uh, and the theme, the theme for this, uh, uh, the whole free market roadshow this year was disruption and innovation. And uh, in, the, in the field of education, so I mean, education is always a hot topic among uh, advocates of uh, the free market. Uh, we're usually not happy with it. I think there's, uh, there's uh, around the world you see different examples of bad government education. You uh, don't see many examples of good government education. So I think, I think we, uh, we tend to uh, agree that there's a problem and it needs to be fixed and then have uh, different ideas of how that might be done. Um, but with the current pandemic and um, essentially educators being forced to change their ways, uh, at least in, in how they deliver uh, you know, the, the, their product, let's call it that, uh, there is, there is a um, room there for, I think, people who have different ideas to step in and provide uh, better solutions than are currently being offered. So uh, to discuss this topic, we have four speakers. Um, Dr. Callum Nicholson is the UK correspondent for the Economic Standard. Mary Lucia Darst is a PhD candidate from Oxford University. Uh, Sophie Sandor is a documentary filmmaker and writer who is uh, releasing a documentary about the education system soon. And Dr. Andrew Bernstein is uh, an author, a novelist, uh, and he is also working on a book on education. So we will start with our uh, first speaker, Dr. Nicholson. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to uh, contribute uh, to the panel and, and to the Free Market Roadshow. Um, so in 2018, the, the Britain's uh, former astronomer, Royal Martin Rees, published a book called On the Future, The Prospects of Humanity. And in this, he outlined the challenges uh, we'll face in the coming decades and century. And these included climate change, AI, even meteors, and rather presciently, uh, pandemics. Um, very different phenomena, but I think they all have something in common, which is they were all framed as a or post-political threats, almost as if they were threats that render our petty political differences irrelevant. But the truth is that even in the face of such challenges, how we respond is, of course, politically conditioned. Uh, we're seeing this today in response to the pandemic, which has revealed uh, the varying levels of transparency, the varying definitions of mortality, the varying coping strategies, the different values, capacities, and competencies of different governments and nation states. Uh, China, of course, is under-reporting its figures. The WHO is uh, uh, coddling China with this. Uh, the Trump administration is, one could argue, abusing uh, its position right now towards its re-election. And in the UK, the UK government's doing everything it can to avoid any uh, attention being drawn to its austere idiocies of the past decade. Um, but even before this pandemic hit, we were all very well aware that the most pressing crises facing the modernist project at the heart of liberal democracy were inherently political ones. So from the right, we've had sort of uh, a neo-nationalist movements in terms of Trump, Brexit, which have been largely indifferent to the idea of objective truth or even facts and operate in purely figurative terrain, you know, phrases like get Brexit done, make America great again, very figurative, very hard to tell what they actually mean. And on the left, we have the countervailing sort of neo-Puritan identity politics movement, uh, which have shown equal indifference to the idea of any objective truth, claiming that everyone can have their own, which makes a mockery of the very idea. 
And instead of being figurative, their language is increasingly very uh, literal. They often look at language devoid of intent or context. Um, so both of these movements have, of course, uh, informed the response to the pandemic. You know, of course, Trumpism is leading to skepticism in, this, in the US about epidemiology, and identity politics has led some quite prominent politicians to interpret any mention of the virus's geographical origin as tantamount to racism. Now, both of these movements, both of these tendencies, I think are addling to our capacity to have a rational discussion or rational thought in the face of this crisis. But these new political ideologies have, of course, been incited and sustained by the appearance of a new technology, that is the internet in general and social media in particular. And the growth of the internet has challenged, I think, the very idea of there being an authoritative voice on really any subject. We now live in a world of authors rather than simply authorities. Everything is tribal. It used to be that we all had to reconcile our different perspectives with the same facts. But these days now everyone tries to convince everyone else that there is only one perspective and we all draw on our own facts. So this is kind of one of the changes that's happened. And this sort of tribalism, I think, that has arisen, uh, or the tribalism that has uh, arisen from this, poses, I believe, an existential threat to liberal democracy itself, I would argue, the greatest accomplishment of the one world. Um, most of the threat are its key institutions. So in the UK, Parliament is increasingly bypassed, as we see in the Brexit referendum. And of course, the same is happening in the USA with uh, the proliferation of executive orders or governing by executive order, as well as gerrymandering, which is reducing the etiolating the strength of Congress. Uh, the press is also less and less able to scrutinize national or even local executives, largely because they've been losing their reputation, largely because of the need to generate clickbait, because their financial models are no longer viable in the age of social media. And as for the judiciary, um, the, the third branch of government, its independence is increasingly being questioned uh, and often not entirely without reason because increasingly a lot of decisions that 20, 30 years ago would have been political decisions have been passed to the courts. So the courts are increasingly imposing on political terrain as people like Jonathan Sumption, the Supreme Court Justice of the UK, a retired Supreme Court Justice, argued in his Reese lectures last year. But taken as a whole, what we're seeing in the Western liberal democracies is I think a growing tension between our democratic freedoms and their key facilitating tenant of freedom of speech, or freedom to not be silenced, essentially, and our technological capacities. And I think an analogy is perhaps useful here to illustrate what I mean. We can view building a democracy like laying down a highway system, and then the invention of the internet is akin to building a very particularly powerful car to drive on that highway. But this technology, I would argue, is leading to political gridlock at best and crashes and pileups at worst. And when two things come into conflict, inevitably one of them will triumph. And in this case, it is, if it's a case of democracy versus technology, which do we really think is going to triumph? And as the saying goes, you can't uninvent the wheel, but a highway can be closed. But I think the cost of this current conflict could well be democracy itself. This is, I think, the challenge we face in the West in the, 2020, in the 2020s, um, certainly over the coming years. And where can we find the solution? And I don't think we can find the solution in politics per se, because politics is where the problem is playing out. And I don't think we can find it in knowledge and technology, because that is the thing causing the tension. Uh, and if we're in this position because we've basically had political devolutions to democracy that have come into conflict with our knowledge revolutions to social media, I would like to suggest that the solution comes by adding a third leg to the stool, and that is an educational evolution to map with the political devolution and the knowledge revolution namely a need to evolve our educational system to train people how to handle the technology to speak to and hear from any and indeed everyone instantly in a society where they have the freedom the political freedom the necessary political freedom to say and to hear whatever we wish continuing this analogy if we have built a highway and produced cars to drive upon it perhaps now we need to train people how to drive the car on the highway safely in other words in the face of the challenges posed by the accumulated technological innovation of centuries, which has led to social media. We now perhaps need a philosophical innovation in how we educate to cope with the tensions that this new hyper-connected age maps onto our democratic body politics. The question therefore is, how have we been educated to think until now? And what exactly do we need to change? And to answer this, I think we just need to very quickly 
uh, view this problem with a much deeper and rather Whiggish sort of historical sense of historical perspective. And I'll be very quick here and getting to the end. So the, it may sound like I'm, I'm about to go on for a long time, but uh, bear with me. The invention of the printing press in the mid 15th century Europe famously marked the end of the so-called dark ages, as with the new ability to rapidly duplicate and disseminate texts, information was democratized. By analogy, people who had previously had an underexposed picture of the world suddenly had a pretty relatively well exposed picture of the world. This invention allowed in the early 16th century for the reformations, which were the semi-simultaneous emergence of a plurality of challenges to the monolithic authority of the apostolic Catholic Church, and ultimately also allowed in the 17th century for the advent of modern science, and on the back of both the emergence of the modern European nation state, freed from the power of the church, informed by science and rationalism in its administration, and scrutinized by news media who could print and disseminate their papers daily. For the 500 years since the invention of the press and the reformations, our educational systems have been about the enlightening of an underexposed picture of the seeking and generation of facts. This has been hugely successful, keeping governments reasonably to account and revealing truths and dissolving mysteries, be they terrestrial or celestial. But the recent invention of the internet has done something, I think, of equal magnitude, but of opposite effect. Whereas the printing press led to the correction of an underexposed picture, the internet and social media in particular is leading us into an overexposed picture of the world we see. And as any photographers know, under and overexposure lead to the same thing, an inability to see what is in front of our nose. So I think our problem today isn't having too little information, it's that we have far too much. And while the printing press led to the reformations that began, that began the modern age, we could argue that today, the internet is leading to deformation, the dangerous talking of our culture and politics, which could end the modern period. Our educational system isn't designed to combat this. It is designed to train us to produce knowledge of technological use or industrial use, rather than to triage it, to inoculate ourselves against its abuse. What we now need, I think, to preserve democracy is an innovative evolution in our educational system to equip people with the discipline and awareness to handle this new technology in the context of democracies. And what form might this new approach to education take? I'll simply end by, say, by suggesting that we might learn from something we've all been paying very close attention to in the last couple of months, which is epidemiology. Epidemiology literally translated means the study of what is upon the people. And I think it's hard to deny that viral ideas, be they neo-puritanism or neo-nationalism or neo-socialism or whatever it may be, are upon the people in the body politic with as much prevalence as biological diseases can be upon the body. And I think there's much more to say about what an epidemiological approach would entail uh, to ideolo ideology and ideas. But the purpose of this brief outline now is just to say, in the face of innovation, I think we need to evolve our education. And this evolution must itself be innovative not just in its form, but also in its perspective, its purpose, and its function. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nicholson. And uh, before we go on, I will say uh, that if anybody has a question for any of our speakers, you can uh, raise your hand using the raise hand function on, uh, on Zoom uh, at any point, and you will just automatically be placed in a queue uh, for when we go to a QA. and a uh, but for now, we'll go to our next speaker, Mary. Sorry, uh, I oh, unmuted you me. by accident. You're oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Asi, and uh, thank you to the Free Market Earth Zone for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, by the way, in case it isn't apparent from uh, my accent, I'm American. I'm not Buddhist. The, um, so uh, I, I've come to, uh, to holding an interest in education based uh, largely on my own experiences um, rather than any studied expertise. Um, I and my siblings were homeschooled um, from kindergarten up until entrance to university. Um, at the time my parents decided to homeschool us, it, it was considered a very outlandish, very countercultural decision. And uh, back then there were fewer resources available than there are today. And uh, my mother uh, relied on Laura Barquist's book, um, Designing Your Own Classical Curriculum. 
as a, as a guide for how, how to go about educating us. Uh, as a side note, the state we lived in did not have school choice. Um, it does now in the legal sense, uh, but not in the infrastructure sense, uh, as there's still um, very strong opposition to implement, implementation of school choice. Um, my own views on education uh, concern a, a, a broader change, uh, which would, I think, support innovation. Um, first, I think our education ought to be uh, decentralized. Um, there are uh, alternatives to institutional public education available, and I am aware from a first-hand experience that knowledge of and exploration of these alternatives is actively discouraged by uh, contemporary education departments, boards, or school districts. And as well as I think a decentralization would assist in returning students to a, an innovative mindset by breaking up a monopolistic industry that, that is what edu institutional education has become. Um, additionally, uh, decentralization of school choice encourages active decision making uh, rather than passive acceptance of a preset system. Second, I, there, there should be a rejection of vocationalism, the teaching of limited subjects in education. Uh, vocationalism, which I define as teaching with the mentality of getting a job, uh, stultifies the mind and creates a, an environment hostile to uh, innovation. Um, I've observed that with vocationalism comes a fear of change, a fear of being made redundant. And uh, once it enters an education system, the dependency dynamic becomes present where the products of such systems have a vested interest in opposing chains as do beneficiaries such as um, teachers and administrators. Uh, I will add that vocationalism in, in intellectual education is different from vocational schooling. I am aware that there are people for whom a liberal arts edu uh, education is unsuitable. Um, the, the toolbox uh, for an educational model that encourages innovation and would disrupt the current system already exists. Um, the classical education, by which I mean the classics and the trivia more generally, uh, can prepare anyone and everyone for a changing world. Um, this is possible because the classical education is geared toward teaching the ability to think, to reason, and to analyze they're like creating minds that are capable, in my view, of bearing what uh, the burden, because it really is, of independence. Um, and of course, such skills go beyond vocational training and aren't invalidated by technological change or societal suits. Um, I'm aware also that there are some common objections to my three major points. Uh, first, that the centralized system, which in the U.S. is the, uh, the public educate school system, provides for the less fortunate and fosters equality by ensuring that people from different backgrounds mix with each other. Um, I will say that this, as a statement, is true, uh, but it, the situation isn't one of education. It's uh, one of social engineering, um, acquisition of knowledge, uh, certainly usable knowledge is reduced to a secondary concern. Um, supporters of the current education system claim that, that it prevents favoring of wealthy families and prevents inequitable concentration of resources. Uh, many opponents of school choice cite this argument as a reason to avoid deregulating the education market. And in my home region in the US, we are having this conversation right now. Um, the rebuttal is that as it stands right now in the U.S., the majority of innovations and uh, su successful career records are developed by individuals associated with uh, private institutions, which right now is primarily MIT and Stanford University. Um, Carl J. Sean's work, The Entrepreneurial Imperative, which I believe dates to 2006, highlights the uh, connection between the private U.S. universities' ethos of encouraging risk to take into their success in producing entrepreneurs and, it, and uh, leaders in innovation. I believe that, the crea that creation and innovation as a concept follow the same patterns as entrepreneurialism. 
um, the concentration of wealth and resources, which has been erected as a straw man by those opposing the free market in education has, has actually already occurred. And uh, so my final thoughts on this topic are that I don't believe it's an accident that most of the objections to changing the status quo are founded on variants of the so-called anti-elitism argument. Uh, the ideological foundation for the, is the urge for utter equality, which is pitched through a rhetoric that suggests a zero-sum world. Uh, one of the best examples I can think of is uh, President George W. Bush's educational reform, which were titled um, No Child Left Behind. And, um, uh, and a system which teaches children to focus on winners and losers um, cannot teach innovation. This is because such a system is, uh, the goal is to win in the present, according to the metrics of now not to think of the future, not to think of prospective gains, uh, a very small and predictable win is preferable to one that might be greater but is riskier. Um, in addition to the solutions I mentioned earlier, I think it's important for education as a field to cease trying to be a bandage, uh, a panacea to social problems. Uh, the role of the school is to instruct, um, not to be a paternalistic social force, and uh, the, those who can think for themselves are capable of caring for themselves. And it's been my observation that these are the people who drive uh, innovation and create so true social progress. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, our next speaker is Sophie. Hello. Uh, Sorry about that, my internet went down. Thank you for having me. So uh, there are two aspects of why I'm interested in innovation and in education. Uh, one is what my documentary explores, which is the UK's state education and why it delivers a bad deal to the poorest in particular and uh, what um, low-cost private schools, the idea of low-cost private schools. So why does the, the state supply education? The standard answer is that it helps the poor, but that's not what actually happens. Children from low-income families are nine times more likely than the wealthiest to end up in one of the country's inadequate schools. And they make up the vast majority of the 20% of children who leave school functionally illiterate. So today the poorest really are getting a bad deal out of the system in the UK. I'm interested in this because I happen to attend one of the worst performing schools in Scotland um, and it was me and many of the children around me at school who were in need of the very best education and yet we were at such a school. When the state provides schooling free of charge funded from taxation, private schools can't compete. Only the rich can afford to pay their taxes and then pay to send their children to private school. So most children go to a state school, while the children of the rich attend expensive private schools. There's no place for private schools aimed at educating poor children at the moment. That harms those children. Profit-seeking companies competing for the business of paying customers offer products tailored to the needs and preferences of their customers. Monopoly suppliers do not. Being protected from the losses or bankruptcy that normally follow from disappointing their customers, they lack the normal incentives to avoid doing so. They offer the product they prefer, not the product their customers prefer. When parents can't get what they want for their children to the normal market mechanism, they must act politically. That's difficult even for well-connected middle-class parents. For poor parents often ill-educated themselves, it's effectively impossible. So the education offered by the state caters better to the children of the middle class than the children of the poor. Parents with high incomes can also secure superior state educations for their children by buying houses in the areas of the best state schools. By doing this, they effectively buy a superior education for their children, but through paying high house prices rather than school fees, of course, or they pay for private tutors to supplement the state's education. Of course, poor parents couldn't afford to buy their children a private education, even if a relatively cheap one these days is thousands of pounds a term. That problem could be solved by providing poor parents with the money, by instead providing them with a free education for their children. As happens now, the state removes their consumer sovereignty. 
Parental choice does not require parents to be educational experts either. We can all judge the quality and value of things we don't understand the inner workings of. Laptops, cars, fridges. Not only can we observe the results, but we get information from others supplied by the media, advisory businesses, and word of mouth. Many of those most vocal about the schooling system exhibit extraordinary selfishness. To give you an example, parents who live in the catchment areas of top state comprehensives often oppose grammar schools or private schools and grounds that they are elitist. This is fine for them given that their children are getting the best of the supposedly undifferentiated comprehensive system. Influential people perpetuate this system, turning a blind eye to its undesirable, rea undesirable realities. We must increase the funding of state schools as the standard answer and you'll see playing out all over again and forthcoming general election campaigns. But the problems don't arise from a shortage of funding. They arise from the absence of consumer choice and of incentives to attend the, pre the preferences, attend to the preferences of parents and pupils. The poor are held hostage in schools they wouldn't choose, while the educational establishment enjoy choice for themselves. This is where low cost private schools come in. Uh, which until recently was uh, separate to anything that's going on in the UK education system. But in September 2018, the UK's first low cost private primary school of its kind was opened in Durham by Professor James Tooley, an entrepreneur you may have heard of who recognises the severe shortcomings of the system. While the average private school's fees are over 17,000 a year, at this new school there are only 2,700. £52 a week. It's called the Independent Grammar School Durham and it's for children aged four to nine and will eventually take pupils up to the age of 18. His plan is to turn this first school in Durham into a chain of low-cost private schools in the UK. He has already, James Tooley, has already founded schools in Ghana, Sierra Leone and Liberia, but he's worked all over the developing world in Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, Latin America and other parts of Asia. In some slums in Hyderabad 20 years ago, at a time when everyone thought that private education was for the elite and the upper middle classes, James Tilly discovered low-cost private schools for the poor. He discovered that the private schools are serving everyone in the poorest parts of the world. That's when he researched this phenomena across the world to see what disadvantaged kids were doing and their parents were choosing private schools for them. At the government schools, though ostensibly free, you still need books and shoes and uniform and transport. These schools are often quite far out from the villages, so they are not free and the state schools are costing much more once that's factored in. In Ghana and India, the rough cost of one of James Tooley's low-cost private schools is $10 a month. As a proportion of the annual household budget, that's 10 to 20%. The poorest parents in the bottom quintile of wealth in the poorest slums are sending their children to these schools. 70% are in private schools and they're outperforming the government schools. They're sustainable and they're scalable and they run as businesses. The poor are saying that they value education and that they don't like what the government's doing with education and that they're going to do it themselves without a penny of aid from anyone else. There's a huge body of evidence now, most recently in the latest research paper from the Institute of Economic Affairs on Education. It's called School Choice Around the World. Uh, that poor parents in developing countries are not prepared to acquiesce in mediocre government provision. This leads them to use private schools, even though government provision is typically available widely. The proportion of private school enrolment in developing countries is two to three times the private enrolment share in developed countries. Not only do people uh, have choice in these countries, but they create choice out of their own limited resources when the state's free school system is unable to deliver quality. So why are the private schools outperforming the government schools in these areas? In the government schools, the teachers are demotivated and unionized and cannot be removed. In the private schools, the teachers are employees and if they don't turn up and don't do what they're supposed to do, they'll be removed. So low cost private schools solve a problem. The option to attend them would make it easier for lower income families to escape and fill a gaping hole in the market for affordable private schools which is no easy feat in the face of the state's monopolization of the sector that we've seen over the last few decades. The state has the potential to aid this by stepping back and not running the education system, by giving parents the money they currently pay in taxes towards education to attend private schools. That would be my solution. Private education, as I've mentioned, has been largely crowded out by the state, creating a tiny expensive private sector that caters just to the wealthy 
but costs can be cut partly by doing away with many of the frills that bizarrely have become typical of state schools, meaning parents are paying for parts of a service that they don't value and would rather not pay for. James Tooley's school, as an example, puts a strong focus on mastering the basics and traditional subjects, and this could spur on numerous different types of low-cost private schools in the future, and even the, the kinds of skills that I disagree with myself and that James Tooley disagrees with. This would enhance choice. Parents who don't value what certain schools prioritise at the moment would not need to pay for them. No one is forced to send their children to low-cost private schools or to work in them, and they only survive if they improve on existing skills. Good skills don't need to worry then. Meanwhile, inadequate ones would be weeded out to the benefit of everyone. Apart from the few suppliers of state education who wouldn't be receiving money in the first place, had the system not created unwilling customers. Uh, so I'd just like to quickly finish on uh, a reminder of the history of state education in the UK. Uh, people often take for granted that there's a state, edu state education system in this country. Uh, they think that without the state, the poor wouldn't be educated. But the evidence shows historically that's not true. In 1861, there was no tax-funded education in England. The Newcastle Commission of that year conducted detailed research around England and Wales and showed that 95% of the school age population was in school for six years. Some children were enrolled in church schools and some in elite public schools, but half were in what the inspectors at the time called for-profit schools. These were the 19th century equivalents of the low-cost private schools that we see in poor countries today. The 1870 Education Act, 1870, uh, aimed to fill the few gaps that then existed uh, in the education of English children. It was not intended to destroy the low-cost private education sector, but by providing tax-funded and unpriced education, it inevitably had that effect. It may have been well intended, the Education Act of 1870, but it was a historic mistake. The state is not a good teacher and especially not of the poor. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Our final speaker is Dr. Bernstein. Thank you, Razi, and thank you to the Free Market Roadshow. It's good, good to be back, even virtually. It would have been more fun touring all over you know, Europe this spring, but, but one does what one can, right, in times of a pandemic. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm an American, born, born raised, uh, went to the public schools in Brooklyn, New York, where the cool kids are from, and uh, still, live, still live in the New York suburbs. And there's two, um, yeah, there's, there's lots, of, you know, I'm gonna focus on American education because that's what I know having gone through the government schools, you know, K through 12, lucky me, you know, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, I teach, uh, I, my PhD is in philosophy, so I've been teaching philosophy for years at various uh, American universities, and I get the product of, of, of many of, uh, of these schools and these poor kids, and I like the kids a lot. I mean, uh, they're really, they're great kids. I mean, they're good American kids. They, they want to have a career and they want to be productive and, and prosperous. They want to have a you know, romantic relationship. They want to be happy. But these poor kids are semi-illiterate. And uh, you know, they, many, many of them struggle ju just to read effectively, ne never mind reading comprehension. Can't write, forget a college level essay. In many cases, can't write a, you know, a lucid paragraph and don't know the first thing about American history. I mean, I was shy. It's not funny, but it's some things you laugh or cry, right? I mean, I was shocked one day in class recently at 20 kids in the class. They're all American kids. They all went through the school system. Not, not one of them, not one out of 20, never heard of Patrick Henry. And roughly half of the 20 had heard of James Mattis. Few knew, a few knew what he had done in his life. But roughly half of the class of 20 kids never, never heard of James Madison. I mean, I was like, I was sputtering with frustration. You know, I mean, I mean you never heard that he's the lead author of the U.S. Constitution, virtually the sole author of the Bill of Rights, and you ever heard of him? That, that, that's, the answer to that is yes. And it's not primarily the kid's fault, although you know, a number of them certainly could choose to work harder in school than they do. It's overwhelmingly the fault of the educational system. They don't teach history. Of, they, they teach not even a modicum, a minimal amount of history. They don't call it history, they call it social studies. You know, for you know, for for a hundred years. So, the, school, the, the the American schools are as bad as everybody says they are. Maybe worse. 
That's why I'm writing a book on, on this. Rudolf Flesch wrote a famous book, 1955, Why Johnny Can't Read. Flesch was Austrian. He, uh, he, he was appalled by the reading problems he found in the United, when he came to the United States. He had a PhD uh, in library science from Columbia. I think he had a JD from, from Vienna. Um, but he pointed out that there weren't any reading problems in Europe back then. Maybe there are today. I don't know if they're following the American model of, of, of schooling. But as uh, you know, Flesch pointed out, the European schools use phonics to teach reading. The American uh, educators had gotten away from that, going back to Dewey and the progressives at the time of World War I, and trying to push phonics off the scene and use you know, various iterations of uh, the whole word method, book say, whole language, whatever it is. And why Johnny can't read, to put it simply, is because the schools don't want him to read. The schools uh, pushed off the, off the scene phonics, the method, the effective method for teaching reading. So the title of my book is Why Johnny Still Can't Read, you know, or Write, Spell, or Understand Math, and what we could do about it. Uh, so, I mean, for today, I only have a few minutes. There's two things I want to talk about, what, what we can do about it. First of all, we need to identify that the schools of education and the teachers' colleges in the United States, I mean, let me start off here with, uh, you know, the schools of education, you know, Columbia University Teachers College, uh, you know, an infamous example, uh, where, where a, a lot of the poison got started with people like John Dewey, William Hurd, Kilpatrick, George Counts, people who are progressive, so-called progressive education. By the way, that sticks in my craw because uh, it reminds me of the great Chinese philosopher Confucius who said a long time ago that the beginning of wisdom is to see to it that things are called by their right names. And there's, there's no progress in the so-called progressive movement. We should call it the regressive uh, movement because it's, it turned out a society of semi-illiterates and was designed to do so. Anyhow, uh, Arthur Best or the American historian the 1950s wrote a book called Educational Wastelands, and he coined the term interlocking directory. And when he's, 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 he asked the question, who really has the power in American education? Bestor's interlocking directory is the answer. And what he means by that specifically are the, the schools that, one, the schools of education, the teachers' colleges, two, the state departments of education, and three, the federal department of education. This is the this is the power. These are the, the, the interlocking best doors, interlocking directory. This is it. These are the, these are the people who have the power in education. Thirty years later, E. D. Hirsch, uh, English professor, at University of Virginia, wrote a book. What was the name of it? The, the schools we need and why we don't have them. Well, the schools we need, of course, are ones that focus on academic education. And why we don't have them is because the the interlocking directory doesn't want us to uh, to, to have them. So. One point I want to make here is the interlocking directorate, what, what Hirsch called an impregnable fortress, which it may well be. Uh, we may need to circumvent it. I don't know if we're going to be able to change it. By the way, that reminds me, the, the great journalist H.L. Mencken, who wrote for many years for the Baltimore Sun, I think he covered the Scopes Monkey Trial uh, for the Sun. But be that as may, <laughs> Mencken said a long time ago, he said, the, the, all it takes to fix American education is to burn down the schools of education and hang all the professors. Yeah, you know, now that's maybe a little bit extreme, I, as much as I would like to put that in, into practice. You know, murder and arson is probably not something that we want to, you know, people who believe in individual rights and, you know, and, and econ political economic liberty, probably not activities we want to be in, involved in. But Mencken's heart was in the right place. He recognized the enemy here. The schools of education, best or interlocking director, to put it simply, are virulently opposed to academic education. And, though, and I'm, I'm, I imagine many people, you know, who follow the free market roadshow probably know something about the history of philosophy. They recognize Plato's influence here. You go back to the Republic, where Plato called for the philosopher king, you know, for the paternalistic rule of an intellectual and, and educated elite. Well, John Dewey and the regressives around the time of World War I shared, you know, shared that vision, you know, and, and that, that's when IQ testing first became uh, available. You know, we IQ test the kids. This is put Plato's dream into action. We IQ, IQ test the kids. We find the brightest. We fast track them. We give them their full academic program. They, they, these are the kids. They're going to learn mathematics, literature, history, science. They're going to they're get basic cognitive training, basic thinking skills. They'll read well. They'll, they'll learn to read well and write well and learn, learn basic mathematical calculation. They'll basically be able to think. And, you know, that's a a small minority of the American population. The rest of us, you know, we don't need to, we don't need to, th th these guys are going to be society's future leaders, you know, these well-educated, 
you know, Plato's intellectual elite. They'll be the politicians and the business people, you know, and, and the, the lawyers, the doctors, the writers, the journalists, the filmmakers, and so on and so on. The rest of us, we don't need that kind of academic training. We don't need basic, you know, we need very rudimentary cognitive skills. Uh, and, and our focus should be on vocational training. You know, you bring in shop classes and home ec and, you know, on practical skills, hygiene and sex ed and driver's ed, you know, things like that. So we'd be, we be good citizens, good, worker, good workers in the factories or on the farms. We don't need to think that much because the educated elite will govern in the classroom and in the legislature. And we, all we have to do, the rest of us have to do is basically obey the wise rules of the state. That was the vision and still is. So there's a virulent anti-academic uh, prejudice that permeates the interlocking, interlocking directorate here. And, and, and Hirsch may well be right, may well be an impregnable fortress. Uh, the, the good news, of course, is most parents, even today, when most of them have gone through the, the government schools themselves and, you know, and, and, and struggle cognitively, most parents still want their kids to get a, an academic education. They still want their kids to learn the classic three R's effectively. They want, and, and one piece of evidence supporting that is how many parents are willing to pony up to send their kids to college. You know, want their kids to, to, to go to a good college or, or, or if not, they can't get into a so-called good college, go to any college and the parents are willing to work hard and, you know, and spend money to support the child, you know, Johnny or Judy's uh, college education. So the parents still, uh, let's put it this way, as a general rule, I think overwhelmingly, the parents tend to be much wiser than the, uh, than the interlocking director. Uh, they want the kids to get an academic education. They want the kids to have knowledge. They want the kids to, to, uh, to learn how to think, which means, my second point, if we privatize the educational system, which I think is one step towards improving it in the United States, I think there would be uh, a strong demand for, edu for education. I think we'll see a proliferation of different types of schools, whether they're large educational corporations or small schools like Marva Collins started out Westside Prep in Chicago which for many years was, was a brilliant success. You know, uh, it, it, I, I don't know, it was in her basement or in the, the apartment of a friend or something with a, you know, a small school with a, few, with a few students. And she built it into a, you know, a, a brilliant uh, uh, se center of intellectual, intellectual training. Uh, so there'll be a proliferation of different types of private schools. And I think the ones that will flourish on a free market of education are the ones, since parents generally want the kids to, ha to have academic training, I think the, the schools that will flourish are the ones that best teach the kids reading, writing, uh, mathematical skills. And these are testable skills. Uh, you know, and, and teach them, actually teach American history and maybe even some world history. You know, and I think that, you know, the privatizing the school system is one step of several that, that, that will that will effectively improve American education. This one, I, one last point I, I want to make here is you look at the way the free market operates. You know, one example of automobiles in the in the capitalist countries or semi-capitalist countries, you have these, you know, this competition between different manufacturers, you know, whether they're American or they're Japanese or they're German, or, you know, and you have you know, luxury cars and compact cars and sports cars and you know, and, and every different style and, and, and type of car. And I think a, a even more uh, a, a richer example is food. I mean, you walk into an American supermarket, oh, it's like a dream. I mean, you get, get given the history of, of, of starvation uh, um, uh, for the human race, and it still exists in fully socialized countries like North Korea, where your life is, you know, is fully socialized, it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to the state. Uh, the, the, the wealth of food in the, in the capitalist and semi-capitalist countries, of every type of food stuff, dozens of different manufacturers and brand names, it's indicative of what a free market accomplishes. A lot of demand for food, and so you see the, the uh, producers supply it. I do think there'll be a strong demand for education, since, I, again, I think the parents are much wiser generally than the interlocking director want their kids to get academic training. And I think you'll see every type of school proliferate from tiny little schools in somebody's basement that teach three or four students to big, you know, educational corporations. And some schools that use look, say, or whole language to teach reading. Some will use phonics. Some will teach evolution. Some will teach creationism. Some will teach both. And, you know, so on and so on. And the schools that will flourish, I think, commercially in the end are the ones that best satisfy parental demand for academic education. So... That's, that, that, that's my spiel for today, so, so thanks very much.
Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Um, and before we get to questions, we, we already have a couple of hands uh, raised in the chat. And also, um, if anybody watching on YouTube has a question, I'll try to monitor the live chat there. So if you want to post a question there, we'll, we'll try to get to it. Uh, but I have a question first for all the panelists. So uh, I think all four of you agree that uh, there needs to be change and it needs to be drastic. Uh, it needs to be the ideal system would be very, very different from the current system. Um, what sort of steps do you think should be or can be taken in that direction in terms of uh, you know, what would be acceptable or, or uh, marketable to you know, people who generally the population is not on board with uh, free market ideas and I think um, specifically in education. Do you think there is a, a good way to uh, sort of move the needle and is the current pandemic and how it has affected the education system, uh, is that an opportunity um, to, to move in that direction? And we'll uh, reverse the order of speakers this time. So uh, Dr. Bernstein, you go first. The pandemic? Well, I, you know, the pan <laughs> the, with the pandemic, um, education in the United States now is taking place at home, uh, not homeschooling, but, you know, the classes, the classes are online. Uh, and I know my, my daughter is a senior, you know, in a, I won't mention the town or the high school, but she's, she's at a, a government school, public, in public schools are euphemisms, right? These are, these are government, government schools run by the government, funded by the government. You know, the government rips you off through taxes to pay for it. They force the kids to, to, to go to the, these schools, as uh, somebody pointed out uh, earlier, the the the, the, uh, pro the property taxes, the income taxes that fund the government schools, of course, make it difficult and not possible for many lower middle class or poor families to send their kids to private schools. Uh, so one thing we need to do when we privatize the school system, of course, is to eradicate those taxes, so that so that pe the, the parents who who the many parents who demand good, excellent academic education for their schools now have more disposable income to put into it. My, my daughter goes to a, you know, supposedly a top government, you know, public school in a, in a wealthy uh, town in the New York City suburbs. And I, I can tell you, the education uh, there is, 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 is very poor. Uh, and since she's at home now, you know, uh, her, her mom, my ex-wife and I, you know, get, get it really to see more in person of what actually goes on. Because, you know, a lot of people, you know, well-meaning, hardworking parents. They, they, you know, they go. They're on their way to work in the morning. They drop Junior off at, at, at school, and they think, oh, you know, the schools are gonna, you know, take care of the kids' education. Bit no, but thank you for playing. No, that's not generally what happens. You drop the kid off, and maybe, you know, if it's in a, if it's in a good area, the the schools babysit the kids. If it's in a crime rate area, area, the the the, the kids got to deal. The, your good kids have to deal with bullies and thugs, and very often you need armed police officers in in the school. But the, one thing the schools generally don't do is is educate the kids in academic uh, subjects. And by the way, I want to point out some school districts are better than others, and there's still a lot of good classroom teachers who still will teach their heart out, recognize the kids need you know, phonics to learn how to read. They need to learn some American history. You know, they they need to learn basic mathematical calculation. You know, it's, et cetera, et cetera. But for the most part, the schools are are terrible. One thing the pandemic may do is uh, parents now can see more. It's 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 more evident to them than with you know with junior at home uh, doing doing this work at home is that the schools aren't teaching very very little ac academic training and and may wake some of the parents up. So the one last point, answer to your question, Rossi. Again, I won't mention the school. Twelfth grade, like you know. My daughter Penny, who's a great kid, by the way, she's a real sweetheart of a kid. Uh, she's going to college in the fall, and uh, twelfth grade English class. You know what the reading list is? Zero, zero, zero. Nada, nada, nada. They're reading nothing. They're working on their college essays. Now that has some value. They're working on their writing, and you know, and it has practical cash value. Help the kid get into college. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with all that. But in a proper school system, they should have been reading literature from grade one, even if or before. Even if we start out with great children's novels for, for the 
for the young kids. You know, read Peter Pan, read The Secret Garden, you know, read Anne of Green Gables, read these great children's novels and write essays, you know, and they should have been doing this all along, you know, K through 12. And by the time you get to 12th grade, they won't need much help in writing their college essays. But even regardless, you're having a whole school year that's wasted in regards to literature. Now, even when I went to the schools, they weren't very good in, you know, public schools in Brooklyn, but I can remember 12th grade. I remember two things about my 12th grade English. And by the way, I was such a troublemaker in school. I got kicked out of every advanced placement class, every honors and HB class. I was in this garden variety English classes with the thugs, you know, and the goons and everything, uh, you know, uh, even so, I remember two, two books from 12th grade English. James Madison High School, Brooklyn, New York. One was Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Two was Shakespeare's Macbeth. And we, you know, when we, we, you know, we discussed that in class, we wrote essays on it. Uh, uh, you know, and, and now in an elite public suburban, suburban high school, you read nothing. All of 12th grade is wasted insofar as, as your knowledge of, of world literature. Last point I want to make is here is the great scholar Richard Pipes, who passed away a few years ago, you know, taught uh, at Harvard for many years, said that he was shocked that the, the, the applicants to his freshman uh, seminar at Harvard University were egregiously ignorant of the world's great literature. But you know why? Uh, for the American kids anyway, I don't know about the kids from other countries, why, why they're egregiously ignorant of, of the world's great literature? Because the American schools don't teach it, that's why. Maybe the parents now realize that since the kids are at home and say, oh no, they're not doing anything here. They're not getting any, any kind of academic ed education. They can see it more readily now, I think, when it's done online at home. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Uh, I think you and Sophie might uh, argue about which, uh, you know, which one of you had a worst experience in school uh, in terms mm -hmm. of the, the, edu you know, the different education systems. Uh, but Sophie, your thoughts on how we can uh, move the ne needle. Uh, well, one simple way to persuade politicians, as would need to be done in the UK, and I'm sure other countries similar to the UK, uh, would be a, which I just thought about now, this specifically, it would be a campaign that parents could get behind, and this to get rebates on the money that they're paying taxes towards education. Um, I think it would be fairly easy based on the canvassing I've done when I was working on setting up a school, which has not yet come to fruition yet. But I think from what I learned during that time, it would be fairly easy to get parents behind the idea that they should have more choice and uh, not be stuck with their catchment area schools and uh, not be forced to pay for a sort of one size fits all education system as we have now. Another solution is to, uh, which is not separate, is to plow through. It's been very difficult for the entrepreneurs and the, the trailblazers in this country to set up even a free school, which is a government policy, and those are government schools. Uh, and it was uh, something that the politicians of the day were very proud of uh, in this country. Free schools are free to attend, but they're state schools and they're not run by local authorities, by local authorities, so they don't need to follow the national curriculum either but they just parents and entrepreneurs and other interested parties, educationalists, get the money to set them up. That sort of thing was also incredibly difficult to do. So plowing through is another option and it's been especially difficult. It's been very challenging for Professor James Tilley who set up a school which was completely separate from the government. And of course you have all of these bureaucratic barriers and uh, you're competing with agencies who can immediately get the best buildings for schools and the planning restrictions in this country uh, costs a huge amount of money to overcome all of the advantages that the state has, the, the monopolization. Um, and uh, in terms of how the coronavirus has, has been an opportunity slightly, uh, some I've heard some people speculating that the government, and it makes sense, is going to become more favorable, governments all over the world, towards entrepreneurs and the self-employed. Um, so one law in this country is IR35, which has really been a detriment to self-employed workers and especially in schools. Um, my business partner was affected by it and could no longer go and advise in schools because this law basically required that she was on the payroll. Um, so that, that was another way that the innovation 
and the kind of new ideas coming into schools and the, the freedom of people to move around schools and get, see different ideas and get different advice was closed down by this law. And a few times the Conservatives have looked into reversing the law, but they haven't. And hopefully as a result of coronavirus, that'll be one of the things they look to unpick. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, Mary, I think you've uh, experienced higher education in, in several countries, if I'm not mistaken, right? But uh, you, you were homeschooled, which I think is the envy of everybody on the panel. Uh, but uh, yeah, your thoughts on uh, how we can change things. Yeah, the, the first solution I had was abolish uh, the taxes that support the, the public schools. Um, but actually, the second I think uh, that would make a huge difference is I think we should abolish standardized testing, uh, especially in the U.S. Um, I am aware that it has become, in my view, a tunnel that allows schools to put students on into the university system without any real accountability for the product of what the school is producing. Um, I think we should go back to the, uh, the, the old way of universities each have their own entrance exam. And the, uh, the school, schools can teach to that, potentially. Or the student just has to know what worked with that. I mean, to tell them one truth, it worked, it worked for my grandfather, great-grandfather in the uh, early 20th century when um, he went from a small, rural, deprived area of the U.S. post-Civil uh, post War and uh, made it to Harvard. So, And then uh, it has also been my experience at the same time because I went through um, via the uh, music conservatory system, which I believe is called the conservatoire system here in, in the UK. And it, um, the performing arts don't, don't really care about the standardized testing. So I took the required ones, but the, the only thing they cared about was that I could prove my writing and reading ability and my ability to uh, play my instrument. And I, I do think that is better. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Dr. Nicholson, uh, I don't know if you, uh, sorry, yeah, you're unmuted now. I don't know if, if uh, Wait, you're muted now, but now you should be unmuted. Yeah, yeah I muted myself, so there's no feedback, but continue. Uh, yeah, so I don't know if, uh, if uh, things in Cambridge are similar to what uh, Andy is experiencing uh, in, in higher education in the US, uh, but yeah, maybe you can tell us more about that and about how you can, you think. Yeah, so I mean, I have an interesting perspective, I think, because I, I went through six, between the ages of nine and 18, I went through six, I just had to write it down and work it out. I went through six schools in four systems on two continents. So I went to three Canadian state schools and I moved to the UK at 14 and I was at a UK state school, which was dreadful. And then my parents weren't intending to send me to a private school, but they sent me to a private school nearby. And then I ended up, um, uh, getting, uh, having some problems at that school and I had to uh, move to a different school in the Scottish system. So I went to the English private system, the Scottish private system, the English state system, the Canadian state system, and the Canadian state system is in French for the most part. So, um, so I've seen a few different systems and my experience of having seen the private and the state or as the Americans are called the public school system um, is that there isn't really necessarily a difference in the quality of teaching. Uh, some of the best teachers I had were um, in the private, in the public system or the state system, um, largely because I think the, the best teachers don't just teach the subject, they teach the passion of the subject. They're very passionate, charismatic people. And, uh, and I always thought that, and I found this in my own teaching, if you can teach someone why they should, if you can teach someone why you care about a subject and you instill in them a sense of why they could be passionate about it, they're more likely to learn more, uh, do better and enjoy it. And uh, the real thing that made the big difference in my experience between the state or public system and the private system was class size. Now, it may simply be because the private school I went to didn't get very many students anymore compared to what they'd got before the tiger economies crashed in the late 90s. Uh, but we had pretty small classes. Um, whereas in the state system, I've been in classes of, of 25, 30, 40 people. 
uh, I would often be in classes of uh, 10 or 12 people. And really that gave you that face time with the teacher, which meant that they could really see where you were falling off the rails and help bring you back. And so it was a much more of a, a relationally based form of education. And there, there was real value in that in the private system. Um, now, the question I'd have, and I think if you're looking at free market approaches to education, I think the most important to lead on from what I just said and to answer your question about how can you compel people or convince people rather that private uh, that uh, the, the private sector should be the basis for education or could be a viable basis. I think in order to convince people, you need to directly address the, the limitations that people note about the market. And I think the two that come to mind for me, one is the scalability beyond uh, outside of wealthy people. So can you have a functioning private system uh, with small classes if people aren't paying that much? Is that even sustainable as a financial model? And there would have to be an answer to that question. Um, the second question, I think, is a question whenever anything becomes dominated by the market, and, uh, and this is not to say it's wrong, but I think it's important for anyone advocating the market should do so, I think, in, in these sorts of contexts, in these sort of social contexts, should do so by really addressing up front the, the, the elephants in the room, i.e. The, the objections people might have. Might have. And I think the, the big objection that comes to mind is the idea that the market often sees things as um, is only interested in things that are means to an end. So education is a means to an economic end as opposed to an end in itself, a social end in itself. And, um, but on that front, I think the third thing I'd say is that my experience of education across various systems has been the failed point has not really been the form of the education of who's providing it, be it the state or the private sector. There are very good state schools. Uh, they're very poor state schools. There are very good private schools. There are also very poor private schools. And, uh, and I can remember very clearly some teachers I had in a private school who were real jobs worths, and they shouldn't have been there. They shouldn't have been in education. But um, because, they, because the school was run by someone, they were a friend of that person or a relative of that person, they could have the job there. Um, so this notion that the market solves all problems it is more complicated, I find, in some of these schools. But I really think the real thing that's a, um, that's a dead weight on all forms of schooling is the culture of standardization, as Mary pointed out, and it's also the um, audit culture, the very prevalent audit culture in our culture, this idea that every form of value can be quantified, that everything should be reduced and, and quantified. Um, I remember when I was at university, they would have, um, they would, uh, we'd always at the end of a course have to fill out a form saying how well we thought the lecturer did. Now, looking back, what did I know? I was 19 or 20. Well, how am I in a position to judge that particularly? But what was interesting, I was speaking to a professor some years later who was a head of a department. He said, I said, I told him about this and how objectionable I found it. And he said, he always knows how good a lecturer is. He says, I can just stand outside the lecture theater and I can feel the buzz. But what he meant is something that's based on 20, 30 years of experience. He knows intuitively. And I think one of the problems we have in our culture is it does not value something that cannot be quantified. It does not value intuition or experience. As anyone knows, and someone who spent 30 years doing anything, be it teaching, be it a doctor, be it a therapist, whatever it may be, they often just have intuitive insights which come from experience, which they could never necessarily prove, but they just know is the case because of their experience. And I think we have a system which is a very lowest common denominator and very brute, crude, uh, form of education where we think everything that's of value can be quantified. So I really think that the issue, the, the, the problem with our education is far more structural than, than state or market. It's not really about the form it takes, whether it's a private system or, or a public system. Fundamentally, I think the problem is one of its function. Why, what are we trying to achieve with education? Which comes back to my point about if we're trying to innovate, one of the most important questions is what are we trying to do with the education? Not just who's the provider, but what is its role in society? And particularly as society has changed. And for a couple hundred years, we've said the important priority, the priority of education is to uh, provide workers uh, for the fields, workers for the factories, uh, the people to, you know, to uh, do the accounting, the people to draw up the contracts, whatever it may be. Um, but there is always also a sort of intangible civic duty of, the, of schooling. And I think that's something that's absolutely been left to the wayside, partly because I think not so much because of a, a market approach, but because a very technocratic view of what education should be, a very reductive quantifying view of what education could be. And I think there is a space for things to be a little bit more qualitative. And the question I think when we're advocating for a market-driven approach 
is to answer those questions. How can the market, and I put this to the other panelists, I'm curious on their views on this. What, how does the market overcome the challenge of, um, of education um, where, how does it overcome the, the, the incentive to have education as a means to an economic end when sometimes education is about us being a social end in itself? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nicholson. And uh, now we go to, uh, to the Q&A. Our first uh, question is from Liam. Thanks, Razi. Uh, thank everyone. A uh, really fascinating discussion. Um, and I'm going to try and answer the question we just, <laughs> we just left off with. I'll have a stab at it anyway, in terms of how does the market deliver not just the sort of economic benefit, but the sort of social benefit that we want from education. And I think it's worth just exploring where that potential for divergence really stems from. And I think part of the problem here is that the fear about that sort of market failure, if you like, um, that the market won't deliver what society needs, has been used to uh, completely sort of whitewash this whole sector with the idea that you've just got to, you know, you've got to leave it to the government, government to do it, they've got to design the curriculum, they've got to build the schools, they've got to hire the teachers. And uh, yeah, it's a small private sector that sort of lives um, you know, alongside that in the UK and the US at least, and there might be various acts of sort of philanthropy and scholarship to sort of lift people up into that sector. But I, I, I think it's pretty clear that it is a hugely dysfunctional system that is failing on, on all fronts. And I, and I think it's, it's worth, and, and I think there'll be a lot of consensus in this sort of virtual room, um, that, you know, the answer lies somewhere in terms of moving more towards a privatised solution, more market-based mechanisms. And I, I just wanted to sort of explore those a little bit more. But before coming to solutions, I'm quite surprised that, I, sorry, I joined slide eight, so uh, the first speaker might have touched on this, but I haven't heard anybody use the word voucher yet, and I wanted to um, bring that, um, that innovation, which I think stems back to Milton Friedman, square and central into the solution. But before getting, I just wanted to just go back to focus on what is the itch we're trying to scratch? What is the problem here? Um, and, uh, and, and I think it, it's back to, um, Sophie, I think it was mentioned, well, the, the case for state intervention is often articulated in terms of helping the poor. And I think that's, that's right in terms of access to education. But also it stems from this idea of there being a market failure that left to its own devices, private benefits from education will be lower than, um, than public benefits and therefore the state should step in. And unfortunately, that thinking has, has led to the state, you know, missing a step, which is that it could have just stopped by saying, well, we need to step in, subsidise provision um, and bring bring sort of social benefit in line with private benefits and you know economists can draw very simple graphs to show you how you narrow that gap um but but you know they've the other step which is well we we have to go from subsidy to actual actual provision we've got to do it all ourselves and i think that's where the problem lies and 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 the problems i think are twofold and a, a lot has been said, and Sophie did a great job actually of articulating a lot of the dysfunctionality and, and also barriers to change. Um, you know, the first area lies in the result of dysfunctional state, largely state owned provision with very little competition for most students in the land, um, is you, you just get a lower quality product at the end of it. And we've heard that articulated in various forms. And that means that the system is failing in its, its first role, I think, which is to develop human capital. We're underinvesting or we're inefficiently investing as a society in human capital. And, and, and the source of that lack of quality actually is lack of competitive pressure on teachers. There's a great study by an academic, he was the youngest African American to make tenure at Harvard, Roland Fryer, and he features in the, in the Free Economics book and film. He did this great national experiment where he went into a large sample of schools and he gave a thousand dollars reward to um, in one set of schools to uh, depending on the students increasing their performance 
In one set of schools, he gave it to teachers. In another set of schools, he gave it to parents. In another set of schools, he gave it to the students. And guess which had the most effect? Absolutely. It was the teachers. You know, they are demotivated. There's no absence of motivation from kids and from parents. And if you can raise teacher motivation and, and reward them properly and bring in proper competition where bad teachers get sacked and good teachers get, get promoted and take on you know, more responsibilities, then that will raise quality. Now, the second problem with the current system that we have, in particular in the UK, where you've got 93% of, of, of students who go through the state system, 7% go through the private school system, that 7% represent, represent more than half of people in the top jobs, whether it's judges, whether it's civil servants, whether it's the military, doctors, 6% of doctors come from working class in the UK. It's completely failing its second role, which is a, the resource allocation role of matching talent to opportunity in our society. Um, the word merit meritocracy was coined in an ironic sense by Michael Young to describe precisely what's going on at the moment, that the rich would just co-opt a system where there is an illusion of equality of opportunity, but actually to get that opportunity, you need to go to a very good school and a very good university and have a, you know, and buy your way into a very good MBA and old or old girl network. And that is alive and well. And economic studies have shown that the, the tax on social mobility that that implies, you know, if we got rid of, if we could modestly improve that, we could improve national GDP in this country to the tune of 100 billion was their central estimate. So that's, you know, that's 5% of GDP just from the inefficiency, mismatching, you know, talent opportunity. You know, for every, every Billy Elliot that makes it to back school, you know, there's 20 that end up, end up down the pit. Um, so when we think about solutions, we've got to actually address that fundamental problem which is actually about inequality of opportunity. Now, there's two ways to do that in the current system. One is to ban all private schools and send everybody into, into state schools. That's clearly unworkable, and very undesirable. The other way is to take money off the table completely when it comes to giving your kids a good education. And, you know, as, as was related earlier, you know, there's a massive double whammy of paying the taxes and then not having money to afford private education, except if you're in the lucky 7%. Um, and we, you know, we're missing out on that opportunity to turn students and parents into consumers and all the efficiency that drives through the system. No, to the last speaker's point, we're not going to flush out, you know, the fact that you might get a private school with a bad teacher in it. But you, 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 the, you've got to look at the overall benefits of competition. Good schools expand, bad teachers get sacked when you're competing with a consumer's dollar. Now, so the question, and then you have dynamic competition, which is that each school has the incentive to innovate. And I, I think we can all agree there's a complete lack of innovation in the system at the moment. So, you know, this is where vouchers come. If you bring in means-tested vouchers, you take money off the table, not completely, but largely, a lot better than it is at the moment, and you empower the students. By the way, this is exactly what's going on with student loans. They're not perfect, but actually they're a big step forward. We can see the universities reacting. We can see the, the student rankings of universities changing from their historic rankings. We can see some universities innovating, coming with two year degrees. And it's also, I think, what's going on with preschool vouchers, where yeah. you know, the government isn't providing Liam. the nurseries and is leaving Sorry. that up to, to the private sector. So I, I think I just wanted to bring vouchers square and central into this because it seems to me it's the it's the way of unlocking the mechanism. Just privatising free schools, I think a bit of a red herring, it's playing around the edge. We've got to put money in the hands of the of the, of the student and the parent and turn right. them into consumers. All right. Thank you, Liam. Uh, let's start with Mary. So um, it's interesting you bring up vouchers because that is one of the uh, points of contention um, back in my home state at the moment. Um, the, uh, while I agree that vouchers 
or certainly I think the best option if, if we must have a public system at all. The thing that I have observed, and like I said, this is based here completely on personal observation, is that they, while they are certainly a, uh, a, a viable path for um, those who wish to use the education system as a means of social mobility, that still requires a level of um, commitment and drive that has assumes a level of commitment and drive that may not be there. I think in the U.S., um, current education secretary uh, Betsy DeVos uh, oversaw the implementation of a um, voucher-based charter school scheme in um, Michigan. And um, as I recall, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but as I recall, uh, one of the things that became apparent after the the um, infrastructure was rolled out was that the people who benefited from it primarily fit that um, middle class background. Uh, this is not to say there were not working class people in that background, there, there certainly were, but it was the um, primarily the middle class who were committed to escaping or having their children take advantage of the opportunity to move from one school district to a better one. And uh, like I said, right now my home state is having this conversation and um, the, much of it is, concerns the, the idea of um, there are simply some parents who are opposed primarily on the basis of, I, I wouldn't want to speculate, but from what I have seen, a, a certain lack of commitment in that way, assuming that, it, that, the, that the vouchers will provide a path to social mobility or could it affect, effectively ensure that the school system is part of a social mobility um, plan, I, I don't think it's, it's uh, necessarily a safe uh, presupposition. Uh, Dr. Nicholson. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel that sometimes when we discuss education, it can be a case where we, we look at it too much in isolation for what's more broadly going on. And there's a discussion to be had about education, about what it ought to be. And there's also a discussion about, well, there's a discussion about how the world ought to be. There's also the discussion of what the world is. And there's also the discussion of, of what can be done. And I think inevitably, um, there is stratification, yeah, and this is, I'm not saying this as a good thing, but there is, of course, there's a huge amount of strat stratification, socioeconomic stratification in society. And I think whatever way uh, one tries to um, change the sort of institutional or administrative arrangements, be it the balance between private and uh, public uh, schools and so on, whatever we do, uh, whatever one tries to do, ultimately, those, if those stratifications in society exist, the more broader stratifications, that it will end up serving the people with the money and the power. And we're seeing a society that is far more stratified now um, with the 1%, the 99% type idea now than it was 20, 30 years ago. Um, so I think a lot of the problems that we see about uh, difficulties of accessing education and so on really reflect much broader trends. And, um, uh, and unless something changes in the culture, I'm not really sure how we can solve these problems. Most solutions we try and find, if it's not about cultural change, will be palliative solutions, um, uh, meaning the patient will be made more comfortable, but it won't fix the underlying pathology. And it does seem to me that, um, you know, I've always been for, um, uh, you know, pe people's freedom of freedom to trade, freedom to talk, freedom to travel. Um, but at the same time, there are, um, I don't really think a lot of the stuff that's going on in the culture right now of these different, these um, stratifications has really got to do with markets per se. It's got to do with kind of a corrupting of government, which is a very different sort of idea. And, but it amounts to something that looks quite similar. Um, the, uh, but my point is really that when we start looking at education, how can we fix education? My only point, my simple point here is that the problems in education are symptomatic of problems much more deep in the culture, which, are, which appear across lots of other areas. And I think it's important for us to remember that whenever we're looking at these issues. 
Dr. Bernstein. I agree with uh, with uh, Liam Colley. I like his uh, wording when he said, I don't remember the exact quote, but he said words to the effect that we need to get money into the hands of parents and, you know, and the, and the children, students. Uh, and I think the best way to do that, not as an end in itself, but as a means to an end, is tax credits for uh, families who send their, their kids to private schools. Now, I don't want to... Um, I don't, I don't want to support any policy that will continue to sustain the existence of government schools. I'm an abolitionist. I want to abolish the goddamn thing. I, I, you know, I agree with my buddy, Dr. Brad Thompson at Clemson, uh, who calls himself an abolitionist. We need to abolish the government schools for the same reason we need to abolish slavery. It's evil. And it's, uh, it's creating a society of stunted minds who can, you know, who, who can barely read. So I would support tax credits you know, for, for parents who send their, uh, their kids to, to private schools as a means to wiping out the taxes that support the government schools fully as a means to wiping out uh, the government schools entirely and, and fully 100% privatizing the, uh, the, the marketplace of, of, of education. So I think you know, uh, as, as, a, as a step forward, but, but as a step towards the, the goal of full abolition, I would, I would support tax credits uh, for families who send their kids to, to private schools, you know, that way, you know, the, the, the parents aren't paying, uh, paying twice for education or paying twice ostensibly for education, paying for the education that the kids uh, get in private schools and paying for the, what passes for education in the, in the government schools. And by the way, one last point I want to uh, uh, say, say on this is, is that I, I could see, you know, in my experience now in the philosophy departments in, in various uh, American colleges in the, in the New York suburbs, uh, that what Dr. Nicholson said is, is true. Um, there's not that much of a difference anymore uh, in, in my students who went to the government schools and those who went to the private schools. 20 or 30 years ago, there, were, there was still a discernible difference. The kids who went to the uh, private schools generally, there's always exceptions, including the religious schools. A lot of you know, a lot of a lot of uh, Catholic schools in the New York area. The kids who went to the the um, uh, private schools, you know, 20, 30 years ago when I first started teaching, you know, they, they were generally, with some exceptions, noticeably uh, better prepared for college than the kids who went to the government schools. Today, there's not that much difference, and I think. You know, I think the, uh, the interlocking directorate, the impregnable fortress of Bestor and Hirsch has standardized the education uh, in, in the United States to the extent that the private schools very often are not that much better. Um, so I think uh, the, the, the solution ultimately is to work towards a fully free marketplace of, of education where the government has no say uh, in, in education whatsoever, zero, nada, the null set. Uh, in, in the field of, of education and culturally, we need to stress this, the importance of the mind, the importance of cognitive training, the important of, importance of the intellect, the importance of an academic program. And fortunately for us, Ayn Rand has written a brilliant novel, Atlas Shrugged, dramatizing vividly the, the mind as man's means of survival and the, and, and the importance of educating the mind. Unfortunately, in the United States, not a lot of people in the world to read it. But you know we have to we have to bootstrap ourselves. So we need a culture. Uh, we need to, we need to work towards uh, intellectually a culture devoted to you know worshiping reason and, and the mind and uh, and intellectual training and a politics of individual rights, including a free market of, uh, of education. Well, one of the companies that has uh, disrupted and innovated more than most is uh, Amazon, and and on Audible you can get Atlas Shrugged. Uh, in, a, in an e-book, yeah, an audio book. So uh, if you can't read, listen to Atlas Shrugged. Razi, that's a good point. Unfortunately, people who can't read often their vocabulary is severely limited so that even the audio, audio version goes over their heads to some extent. But you're absolutely right. It's, be, it's much better than audio. Yeah. Sophie. Uh, so I certainly agree with uh, moving towards a free market being a, a good idea and uh, skill vouchers, on the other hand, being a, a step in the right direction. Um, so I'll just make a, a separate point, which uh, was mentioned just before Liam spoke, um, which was about us needing to 
agree on what we want out of the education system and then going from there. Um, I don't really think that that's possible unless we live in a dictatorship uh, because we just we all disagree about exactly what we're trying to achieve and what we want our, want for our children and want them to be taught. And so uh, your idea, one's idea of what that is can't be imposed on everyone unless we live in a dictatorship. Um, so that's precisely why more freedom to innovate is required and why a free market would be required so that the various ideas, apart from those that are illegal, such as extremism, for example, um, can exist and compete and improve. Um, I would like the, the kind of teaching methods that I really disagree with, the kind of teaching methods that have permeated the whole state school system, such as progressive learning, um, the ideas that come from Montessori type schools. Um, I disagree with those and the way that they have permeated the system, uh, for example. I'm, if I was setting up a school, it would be very strict, high discipline, um, if it was for disadvantaged kids. But I do want people to be able to send their children to Montessori schools and for those to exist. Um, so I don't think that we could all ever agree um, on what, what we want our children to be taught and how we want them to be taught. But there's certainly, I do agree that the culture, um, the culture and where society is at can help with how we value education because we all agree that it's important. Um, that's all I wanted to say about this. Uh, yeah, and before we go uh, to the next question, uh, Dr. Nicholson. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, two things. Just, just one side point. It brought my point about um, uh, deciding what we're trying to get education to do. I, I think uh, my, my point wasn't so much about um, telling them, telling people what to think. It's more about the need to more deeply ingrain in education the skills for how to think. Um, I think it's, it's less important what people think then people have to have the skills to think. And it's the, uh, one of the problems that I think we've dealt with in, in the culture is that universities particularly try and teach people how to construct arguments. But what they don't really train you how to do is how to deal with people who are not, who are not open, or open to or interested in rational argument, a well-constructed argument. And because uh, most of the problems in life you encounter uh, are not because someone has a devastating argument. It's, because, it's when you can't reason with them. Um, I don't think anyone's ever looked at Trump and thought, oh, what, a, you know, what an eloquent uh, argument he's put forward. It's mostly that you cannot have an argument with him. He's not open to it. And that in itself is a very useful skill, um, actually. He's often underrated for um, his, his, his power of avoiding debate is, uh, I think, it is actually quite sadly a very useful skill in society, mostly because most people he's arguing with don't have the skills to combat it. And so my point is less about telling people what to think or how to think. Um, Second thing I'd say is that the, when we're looking at education, I think one of the real problems we're facing now in the internet age where when we were kids, I don't know how old people on the panel are, I'm, I'm in my mid thirties. When I was a kid, it was just before you'd have a mobile phone going to school. And um, I can't imagine what it's like now for the, well, I do know because I got my nephews and nieces are in school, but they, the, the amount of distraction, um, and I always thought my attention span was bad, but these kids today, their attention span is awful. And it's, um, and it's because if you're constantly using these things with your, uh, your uh, um, getting a dopamine hit from that, those things are the people who design these machines and design the social media, they've done it with a very good understanding of the back doors to human psychology. And they're on record saying as much. And I think education, first and foremost, has to be training people, not just what to even how to think, but also the conduct you need of, of the ability, the discipline, just to put it aside for a while. If you think about what education has done for 150 years is that one of the most important things that education was doing for the culture is to train people to sit down in front of a desk from nine until five. You know, Michel Foucault and people have written about how it, uh, you know, discipline and punish, the idea that what you're really learning in school is clock watching. You're learning how to show up at this time, leave at this time, because that's the routine of a factory. But it seems to me that was a form of education, a form of disciplining, which, was, which is still embedded in our educational system. But I think there are other things that could be embedded in our educational system now, new forms of discipline to deal with the sheer distraction, the sheer grip that these devices and these uh, technologies have on our imagination now, have on our attention. Because if we don't do that, if we can't wean the kids off their phone for a few hours a day, um, how can we ever get them to read the great texts or to even consider finding their own great texts? So I think there is very much, um, and I, I would agree with Andrew on this, that the, there's very much a, 
a need to reinstate some practical skills in schools, you know, uh, um, uh, home economic type skills. Uh, but also, I think part of that is teaching kids uh, um, much more pervasively how, how to actually conduct themselves and, and, and keep their head when everyone else is losing theirs. And we live in a world where everyone, it's interesting, if you think back 20 years ago, 20 years ago, the fashionable thing to be was cool. And that is to not be too engaged with the culture. But the culture's flipped. Now the culture, the, the fashionable thing to be is, is woke or to be really engaged, to be really passionate. 20 years ago, if you had a political opinion in school, everyone would say, be cool. But now, if you don't have a strong political opinion and a strong political position, um, there's something wrong with you, and uh, according to the culture. And you know, like being too cool was a problem. People weren't engaged enough. But being overly convicted, being too tied to one's convictions can also be uh, a very dangerous thing because it means you can't get on with people who disagree with you. And life is about compromise. It's always about compromise. The reason Brexit didn't get anywhere for a long time is because no one was willing to compromise. I and mean, Brexit's still not done because they still haven't compromised. So um, that's my second thought there, that uh, education is about, I think, treating people how to conduct themselves as much as it is about teaching them not just what to think, but how to think. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let's go to our next question from Nikos. Yeah, thanks, Razi, and thanks to, the, thanks to the speakers. So two quick points, last questions. The first is the prospects of change. And Razi, you mentioned the COVID pandemic and in the beginning of this, I mean, when we we're preparing the blurbs, I was way more optimistic that people will see that some of the structures we have in education are not very useful. But when I see the reaction of the people to the virus and to the lockdown, I'm more and more pessimistic. I think Sophie mentioned the, the, the pushback towards grammar schools. And one of my heroes in education is Catherine Birbalso and her grammar and her and her school, uh, uh, how it's called. Uh, uh, well, anyway, one of, the, one of these kind of schools that teach in a different way and have different values. And if you remember the pushback against these efforts, and now this school is, is doing great and still it's still in seen under suspicion. So we already had this kind of toxic atmosphere around education, but now I think this is gonna be even worse. Uh, last week, uh, someone wrote an article in, in, in the Telegraph arguing that schools should reopen. And she had 2,000 comments only on her Twitter page, not on the Telegraph page, on her personal Twitter page, with curses, people saying she should get cancer, she should kill herself, that she's horrible, that she hates children, and that she hates teachers. So I'm wondering, in this environment and in this cultural atmosphere where we see people the group thing and the tribal is being even stronger and the established lobbies in the education having even a, 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 a more tight grip based on the panic of, of the virus. I think change is gonna be more difficult, unfortunately. And I would want the opinion of the panel on that. And the second question, which is very quickly, do we even need anymore the university as in the way we know it? I mean, I teach in a university, so I guess the quote selfish answer for me would be to say, yes, we do. But for example, when you have, when you can learn economics in Mises org, or if you're a Marxist in Marxist org, or there are all these great uh, programs in YouTube or in Udemy or whatever, is it really worth spending three or four years of your life and all that money and having and going to a, basically what is a theme park and uh, you know, four months in the summer, you have to go somewhere, you know, vacation, and then you come back. Do we really need all this in this time and day? Do we really need this? So, basically, would you send your children to university today, unless they have to be something like I don't know, an architect or a doctor? Do we really need universities today? Thank you. Thank you, Nikos. Uh, let's start with Sophie. Um. Yeah, I think we definitely uh, need universities, um, but I think that there are too many graduates, and the idea of the idea behind the government's drive to having towards a greater percentage of the population graduating was that all of the benefits would accrue to them, that accrued to the people who were currently graduating, such as higher earnings, higher quality of life, um, greater happiness throughout their life and more career success and marriage success and all of the other things that are um, 
correlated with having a university degree. Um, obviously, if everybody has a degree, then they, everyone cannot be the best and the value, of course, diminishes. And so the idea that just uh, a degree is a, a good thing to have um, and the idea that the human capital theory whereby going to university is causing you to have all of these skills. Uh, people arrive on campus, on the university campus, with already massive labour market advantages, such as uh, the ability to get better grades, higher IQs, um, the ability to socialise better, they often have more extracurricular skills, they're already going to do better in life. And so the idea that uh, university isn't about signalling and that there isn't a race to get more and more educated, um, I mean, it's, it's just not true. The university is hugely about signaling and that doesn't mean it's not useful. It just means that we need to stop blindly uh, treating a degree as a, a sign of a, a lot of things and as though a degree causes one to be, to be smarter. Um, de one should definitely go to university and study something they enjoy and that they're interested in and take advantage of the massive library they'll never get at any other point in their life and the academics and the contacts and the networking and the stepping stones to the career that they want um, and just being around other people who are intellectually curious and interested in the same things as they are but um, that's what university that's what it's good for um, just by having a degree um, it doesn't yeah so that's that's all I wanted to say about degrees that was a good question Dr. Bernstein. Well, like uh, Festus Satyricopoulos, I'm a, you know, make my money as a university professor. So it's in my, uh, it's in my monetary self-interest to, to have universities. But you know, having said that, first of all, in the humanities programs in the American universities today, overwhelmingly, with some exceptions, they don't educate; they propagandize. Uh, you know, you know they they're, they're leftist propaganda machines, uh, you know, anti-capitalist, anti-American for the most part, pro-socialist, pro-Bernie Sanders, uh, you know, uh, to the, so, you know, they, the, the kids, the kids uh, that go through history, philosophy, literature, you know, sociology programs, uh, you know, it's, it's heavily leftist propaganda, and and worse than that, underlying the the Marxist politics is the postmodernist philosophy. You know, the idea that there's no such thing as an objective truth, and the truth is is racial and and or gender specific. So, uh, the, there's ma male truth and female truth, white truth, non-white truth, so on and so on, uh, which is a venomous. Uh, philosophy it, it precludes the, the very possibility of truth and if it was accurate we many of us couldn't communicate I mean that the, if, if a man and a woman for example have, have a sit down and meeting of the minds or you know a white person or a non-white person which happens every day I mean that refutes the postmodernism you know uh, theory uh, right there it wouldn't be possible on uh, there so anyways it's, it's a propaganda machine but anyhow I think uh, Nico is asking a good question but I but I would ask uh, a, a slightly different question, and that is, can uh, elementary education and secondary education be developed, you know, be nurtured to the point where it provides students the education that the universities today like to think they're providing, even, even if they do not? And I think the answer to that is yes. I think it's, you know, I don't think there's any reason why kids can't come out of high school in the United States, you know, uh, say in, in the in, in the future, not, it's going to take some time to to get there from where we are today. But at 17 or 18 years old, with the education that uh, people who have master's degrees today uh, have, if if they're lucky. So I think my point is, we we can improve uh, uh, primary and secondary schooling to the point where the kids the kids graduate with the equivalent of what they should get in a proper uh, college education. Now, would colleges be necessary uh, for some who, who want to pursue higher education? Who want to, you know, so college then, you know, in in an ed educational system as I envision it, college would provide the education that somebody who has a PhD, you come out, you know, uh, you come out of college with a bachelor's degree, would have the 
you know, the learning that somebody with, with a PhD today might have again, if, you know, if, if, if they're lucky. But I, we've seen that in the past in, uh, in American schooling. You, you know, people, uh, there, 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 there were people, you know, in the early days of American education before the imposition of government schooling in the mid 19th century, I mean, it, it, was, it was superb. You know, you know, people like Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin and James Madison, you know, people like that, you know, the leading minds of the American Enlightenment got us, now granted these were you know, brilliant guys, but still the educational level was much higher uh, today. One last point I would make on this is the essays of the Federalist, you know, written by Hamilton, Madison, and Jay to support the ratification of the Constitution, very sophisticated uh, theories in political science. They were written at largely as newspaper editorials that were read by, you know, every man and every woman. That, that's my college students and most American college graduates today could not understand the Federalist, I'm sorry to say. But, uh, you know, every man and every woman in the late 18th century could and did. And I think that's indicative of, of, of how uh, sophisticated primary and secondary education can become. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Um, Mary. So um, in answer to the first question for the prospect of change, um, I must agree uh, with you and say that at this point, based on the mass hysteria, any change that we might have hoped might come out of the pandemic um, will probably not. I had very high hopes when I saw people being forced to homeschool and consider homeschooling for the first time. And then I have sadly come to realize that not everyone is my parents. The, um, in response to your other question, do we need universities today? And would one of us send our a child to university? In my, in my case, the answer is absolutely yes. I intend to, it is my intention to repeat at every step exactly what my parents did. The, um, but I do agree that we have too many graduates, and this goes back to my other original points of um, getting rid of vocationalism in the school. I don't. I think there is a idea that college equals job that should fall by the wayside, and there is also a um, a um, also goes back to uh, my idea that we need to reinstitute universities having their own entrance exams um, as a type of, um, of uh, accountability, both for the, uh, the secondary system and also for uh, forcing universities to decide what it is they really teach and what they're really about. Dr. Nicholson. Yeah, so I just very quickly before I answer uh, or respond to Nico's uh, points, but just very quickly, something Andrew said about the um, propaganda machine, I actually agree with it very much. I mean, uh, all the universities, I, I'm not particularly left or right wing, I'm pretty pro pragmatic centrist, but that makes me right wing in the UK, which is crazy. And because uh, I'm, I'm not particularly ideological. Um, but what's interesting is that increasingly we see on campuses here and um, and in the US, I think as well, this discussion of safe spaces, that universities should be safe spaces. But the thing that I've always thought, universities have always been safe spaces, meaning they have always been spaces in which it is safe to believe and to say whatever you want without much consequence, which is not something you can say in most jobs. Universities always were safe spaces. They were safe spaces to, to, to explore ideas, to try out bad ideas. And actually, what, what is history? What is the study of history, if not the history of the litany of bad ideas that have existed and the occasional good idea. Um, but the weird thing is that uh, people now see university, universities as safe spaces where people should be inoculated or protected, sorry, protected against the exposure to um, what they see as bad ideas. And the problem is if you don't expose people to something that is diseased, then they don't build immunity as happened obviously in uh, the Americas when people uh, invaded, then the Native people there didn't have the antibodies. And much as with in the last 20 years, much more uh, recent example of the um, 20 years ago, there was a real effort to eliminate peanuts uh, from uh, being around kids at schools because of to stop the kids who get have anaphylactic shock from peanuts. Um, but actually in, in separating the kids from the peanuts, 
you actually led to a proliferation of peanut allergies because people didn't build up the immunity. So uh, I have a real uh, concern, I think Andrew would share this, that the um, that the the idea of safe spaces is very sort of a Puritan left-wing idea that the uh, universities, people should be protected from bad ideas, is actually going to kick people in the teeth uh, and come back to haunt them in a, in a, in a few years' time. Um, having said that, with, with uh, Nico's comments, um, uh, two things. One is, I agree with the, 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 the fact that everyone is so outraged. Um, it comes back to my point that I think one of the most important things we need in the culture right now is an education as, an, as a counterweight to the culture right now. So the culture is extremely animated, extremely hot-blooded, and I think the system should be a little bit more cold-blooded just to slow things down, just to encourage people to be a little bit calmer, to find the compromise, to find, to, 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 to remember it's important to relate rather than just narrate. Sometimes listening to others, having empathy for others, trumps whatever it is you're narrating. Relating trumps narrating, but these days a lot of people think narrating your life trumps relating. I think that's very dangerous. And the final point was about whether universities are needed. I think, of course, universities are needed. But the question is, what to do what? What are they trying to um, sell? Or what are they rather trying to teach? And secondly, uh, to who? And I do think there's been a big flaw in education the last few decades where we've thought progress is when everyone thinks they should go to university. Now in the UK, the Labour government were trying to get a lot more people into university from all different class backgrounds. But what they should have, I think, also been doing is encouraging people from middle class backgrounds to consider taking a trade. In this country, there's a real stigma. If you're middle class, you don't see very many middle class people running tree surgery businesses. But what's interesting, my brother, who lives in Canada, runs a very successful tree company that he began with a chainsaw climbing a tree and it grew from there. Now, in the UK, in the Canada, there's no stigma on that because you can't, uh, the middle class, everyone sounds the same essentially. But in the UK, if you're middle class and you did that, it would have a, a slightly different, um, uh, there'd be a slightly different culture around it. Um, and I think something they could have, uh, th th there's no, someone who's a plumber can earn just as much as someone who's a lawyer, probably more these days, and um, they may find far more job fulfillment, and it takes just as much intelligence, just a different type. And so this idea that an academic intelligence somehow trumps any other form of intelligence, I've always thought is complete rubbish. And I say to someone who's been in academia a long time, but uh, the smartest people I know are people who um, are not academics. <laughs> And some of the stupidest people I know are actually the poor people with the poorest judgment can be academics. Um, I, so I think it's a case of, uh, you know, and this comes back fundamentally to the issue around the role of the market, that one of the problems of the market taking over education recently in the UK is that it's led to education as a means to an economic end. But I think education as an end in itself is very important. And the real challenge for anyone advocating for the market and education is to explain how the market can drive a form of education that preserves the sense that education is an end in itself. That there is an intrinsic and civic social value to being educated, to reading the great novels and so on. And that case can be made, but it requires someone to make it calmly and I think quite eloquently. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nicholson. And um, yeah, when, when uh, so in recent months, the preparations for the Free Market Roadshow uh, were well underway when, uh, when the scale of the COVID-19 pandemic became clear and it became clear that it won't, wouldn't be possible to travel uh, around Europe and um, do events, live events every day for a couple of months. Uh, and the Austrian Economic Center has had to innovate and has had to do it quickly. And I think they've done a, a very good job by uh, uh, setting up these events online. Uh, and I encourage everybody to go to fmrs.digital and uh, look at the upcoming events and the previous events. And you can also find them uh, on the Austrian Economic Center uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and I encourage people to follow the Ayn Rand Center UK. We are also we have also transitioned from a live events business to a an online, uh, basically online events company for the time being. Uh, and we run three events a week. So I encourage everybody to join us at up upcoming events. Uh, and a massive thank you to our speakers uh, and to everybody who was involved in setting this up. Uh, and see you next time. Thanks, Razi. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.